Essentially, I'm going to talk about this kind of uh, uh, quasi-linear equations that are potentially degenerate. So the usual assumptions you find in the literature are these ones, they're being codified, then being um, by Lagishinsky and Dury-Alzer, they are very classical, and of course, a typical model example is the Pilaplacian operator. So uh, my emphasis here is on Lipschitz estimates, and uh, what I would like to do is to consider more general growth and ellipticity assumptions than these ones. Okay, so what about Lipschitz continuity? Let me uh, give you just a theorem that, um, that in uh, different forms have, has been proved up to now. And uh, this is valid for any equation with the right hand side being a measure provided you interpret, you properly interpret the solution. And this tells you that you can pointwise bound the, the vector field, the modulus of the vector field under the divergence symbol by the risk potential of the measure. So once you have this estimate, you can essentially linearize uh, 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 this kind of theory. Why? Because this is comparable to due to the P minus one. This is the risk potential operator. And you know how the risk potential operator acts on uh, measures and on functions in every, uh, I mean, properly defined function space. And therefore you can just treat it as if it were the Poisson equation. So whenever, whatever is the estimate you want to get on the gradient, you can just look at the Poisson equation and then the same estimate gives you uh, you get the same estimate. So as a corollary, for instance, estimates on measure data problems uh, by also Lucio, uh, or estimates by people like um, uh, Di Benedetto and uh, Ivanitz or people like Talenti, they follow because uh, in a local fashion, because you can point twice bound the gradient via the risk potential of the right hand side. So you have linearized the theory. So in particular, if you are on the same, on the whole RN, you get for any quasi-linear equation, this representation formula, which is essentially the same one you have for the Poisson equation, but this exponent that must be there because it makes the estimate respect the scaling of the equation. So essentially, once you have this estimate, you can treat any quasi-linear potentially to generate equation as it were the Poisson equation from the point of view of the gradient estimate. Okay, this tells you that uh, for instance, you can find a suitable uh, reformulation of the classical linear theorems. Let me give you one example, which is especially uh, suited to the problem of proving Lipschitz estimates. Okay, there is this classical theorem of Stein. So uh, this can be interpreted as the, um, the, um, the farthest reaching extension of the classical sovolet mori theorem. You know that if the gradient of a function belongs to ln plus something, then B is ultra continuous. Let's say ln plus epsilon. What happens if you let epsilon go to zero? Well, you would formally have ln, but if the gradient belongs to ln, then the function is just in BMO, so it, it is not even bounded in general. So the largest rearrangement invariant function space allowing for such a statement is the so-called ln one Lorentz space. Which is, pre, which is described prescribing that the level sets of the functions decay fast enough in order to make this integral converge. So essentially, this is a, a slight reinforcement of the LN condition that you make adding a log to a power. And this is exactly what you need to prove that such a, um, an embedding takes place. So these are actually the um, interpolation spaces, and therefore calderon zygmunt theory applies of the essentially equivalent reformulation of the previous uh, of the previous theorem. States that if the Laplacian belongs to mu belongs to a lang one, then the gradient is continuous, because by calderon zygmunt theory you can tell that the second derivatives belong to a lang one, and therefore you apply Stein's theorem. Okay, now. An interesting property is the following. Now notice that if a function belongs to ln1, then the risk potential goes to zero uniformly with respect to x. A theorem 
uh, Tomo Kuzi and myself proved shows that if the measure goes uniformly to zero, if there is potential, goes uniformly to zero, therefore you prescribe a rate of non-concentration of the measure around the house of dimension n minus one sets, then the gradient is continuous. So therefore you, you want to, you make a parallel to this classical theorem of Stein by saying that this condition is invariant. So you get a nonlinear Stein theorem. So therefore this Stein's theorem actually can be extended to any uh, quasi-linear potentially degenerate operator whatsoever. And this goes towards the previous um, uh, the previous remark I made that uh, these kinds of estimates are going to linearize the theory because essentially you control the gradient by the risk potential exactly as it were the Poisson equation. Okay, uh, there's a more general version and a more general version of this is given by this theorem where we now prescribe the regularity um, uh, on two ingredients. The first external ingredient is the measure, the right-hand side measure, and the first and the second ingredient is the coefficient. So this is, this pertains to Calder and Zygmunt theory, which is after all, a sort of perturbation theory. And this per pertains to Schauder's theory. So if you assume that this is in LN1, and this is Dini, then the gradient is continuous. So, uh, the module, the Dini condition is sharp by uh, examples of Mazziai van Schaftingen. So here I would like to stress the role, the role of the external ingredients. So you put a coefficient, which is Dini, and a measure, which is in L1, in L1, so a function, which is in L1, and then you get that the gradient is continuous and therefore bounded. Oh, so I would like to discuss the, how these conditions modify when you switch to non-uniformly elliptic operators. Okay, non-uniformly elliptic operators are very, very classical facts. So these are classical papers by, for instance, Lagishinska and Duralceva. They stem from minimal surfaces, but then they were extended in many, many ways. For instance, there are papers by Lagishinska and Duralceva, by Neil Tildinger, and uh, by Leon Simon and uh, very classical things that started more or less a theory. Um, so in our setting, let me tell you what I mean by non-uniform ellipticity. So uh, the pillar Blaschen operator is a variational one. So it comes from, uh, it can be written as the euler Lagrange equation of a, of a functional like this. And in this setting, I'm considering this, this functional where the integrand is exactly z to the p. So I'm considering this specific choice. Okay, in this way, I get uh, that these kinds of non-uniform, of uniform ellipticity. Why? Because uh, I can bound the lowest eigenvalue by this quantity. Actually, I, I should put the minimum between one and p minus one here as it is written below. And another constant, which is more or less like p from above. So the important thing is that when I do consider the ratio between the highest and the lowest eigenvalue, I come up with something which is bounded. So it is independent of the size of the gradient variable z. So it is independent of the gradient. So, so this is what I mean by uniform ellipticity because after all, if you carefully examine the proofs, this is the quantity that comes up uh, when you try to prove estimates. And, especially Lipschitz estimates. So having this quantity bounded is important. So what about non-uniform ellipticity? In the same setting, non-uniform ellipticity is prescribed by saying that the, the ratio between these two highest and lowest eigenvalue goes to plus infinity when z goes to plus infinity. So these functionals are con uh, <coughs> are connected to those uh, uh, studied at length by Paolo Marcellini, and these are functionals with so-called no standard growth conditions of polynomial type, P and Q functionals. Examples of this are small perturbations of, the, of polynomial functions. And I should say that this function, um, this integrand is still uniformly elliptic, but it has unbalanced growth conditions. 
while for instance this this one is not uniformly elliptic the nearly uh, linear growth one um, so other examples are given by integrants whose growth with respect to the gradient variable is also relating between two different powers like three and five and this is another instance um, and isotropic growth conditions, you want to penalize the growth of every partial derivative with a different exponent. And therefore, you, you, you play with a sort of anisotropicity. And then there are very, very fast conditions when, uh, for instance, you make a Cochenius, Lieberman, Marcellini, but there's also a paper by Craig Evans there where he considers exponential functionals. And, like this. So these functions, uh, these functions are not easy to deal with because uh, they essentially don't, uh, I mean, uh, do not um, verify the so-called delta two condition. So the, 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 as soon as you move a bit inside the integrand, you lose the integrability properties. Okay, uh, so if I go back to polynomial growth conditions of PQ type, uh, there are examples of um, Jaguinter Macellini and then sufficient conditions by Macellini that assure you that if the ratio between Q and P is uh, not very far from one, then you can prove regularity. Otherwise, you go to variational problems admitting even abounded uh, solutions. Um, uh, and of course, making a, putting a bound on the ratio between Q and P is essentially equivalent to put a bound on the growth with respect to the gradient variable of the, of the, of the ellipticity ratio we have seen before. And indeed, these are the conditions uh, considered by Paolo Marcellini. I say that the lowest eigenvalue grows like P minus two, so it scales with the lower growth, with the coercivity, and the highest one grows at most like Q minus two. So the ratio between these two objects is uh, Z to the Q minus P. And the theory of Marcellini and the, I mean, this by now, classical uh, modern result by Marcellini, um, tells that if you assume that Q over P is not very far from one, then you can prove a, a Lipschitz estimate, a local Lipschitz estimate. Um, okay, after these, there have been a lot, very several, I mean, uh, many, many contributions. I would like to tell uh, something about the most recent ones. For instance, there's a very nice paper by Bell and Schaffner where they introduce another method of taking cutoff functions and then they improve the bound from two over n to two over n minus one. Then there's a recent paper, and this is in the scalar case. In the vectorial case, this is false in general, even when p is equal to q, but you can still prove that a minimizer, which is just in LP, then it is in LQ, the gradient is in LQ, and this is by Schaffner. Then as far as the, as the, then as far as the, um, um, the boundness is considered, then uh, Hirsch and Schaffner proved this uh, bound, which is sharp, because this perfectly matches uh, the, the, uh, the result of Marcellini, the counterexample of Marcellini. And then there's a recently interesting paper by De Filippis, Christensen, and Koch, where under additional assumptions using duality methods, they are able to improve from the first to the last bounds, taking n minus two. Anyway, the, the flavor is always the same. Q over P must be close to one. Instead, when you start considering bounded minimizers, uh, um, then you get Q less than P minus one. This is originally in a, for a special case by Wilson and Udaleto, it's a very pioneering paper. And then there's a number of authors uh, uh, that have considered these conditions and extensions. This is Christians and Encolters, they consider Q less than P plus two. I'm going to come back on this later on. The thing is that when you do consider, when you do consider, um, uh, when you do consider special structures, 
when you do consider special structures, then you can say something more. For instance, there's a very nice result by Busquet and Brasco. This is a very nice result with a non-trivial proof that tells that if you take this anisotropic or tetropic integral, that is, this is not elliptic in the sense of the Pilaplacian, not even when all the exponents are equal, then if you start from a, a bounded minimizer, you come up with a Lipschitz result, no matter how the, uh, these exponents are far from each other. So it's a very delicate result that deeply exploits uh, the special structure of the function. Okay, uh, now uh, all these results, uh, they were about no presence of the right hand side. Now I want to go back on the first slides and uh, I want to recall Call that when f is uniformly elliptic, then there's a universal condition allowing for Lipschitz estimates, <coughs> which is f belonging to ln one. Okay, now the first thing is that we want to see is that this ideology of taking uh, uh, only what it appears under the, si the symbol of divergence can be pushed up to non-uniformly elliptic operators. So the assumptions I'm going to consider is I'm going to say that uh, uh, this is a very uh, 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 abuse of notation, of course, there should be an identity matrix here. Uh, but if I prescribe that the lowest and the upper eigenvalues are bounded by G1 and G2, where these are two functions, then I assume a balancing condition, which is the following. I assume that the bound between G2 and G1 is controlled by a power of this quantity. Now this quantity might appear a bit, uh, a bit uh, odd, but it is actually not. Let's see why. Okay, the result is in a recent paper by Lisa Beck and myself and tells that no matter the uniformly elliptic operator, ah, let me just tell you that this H is of power type. No matter the uniformly elliptic operator or the non-uniformly elliptic operator you are considering, still, this condition plays the universal role. So it's an invariant condition. So this idea of making a perturbation on the right-hand side, I think from, I mean, passing from zero to a non-zero right-hand side is stable because there is this um, a phenomenon that uh, when you have a divergence type operator, the only things that matter is its divergence form. And then if what is under the divergence, it's a, it's a vector field that guarantees regularity, then you can still go on up to the very end. Um, what about this quantity? It might appear strange, but it's actually the largest quantity you can control from below using the assumptions you put. Let me show you why. And uh, let me tell you that this is a, um, this, uh, this also holds in the vectorial case provided you have a, a radial structure, which is essential. Otherwise it's false even in the standard uniformly elliptic case, in the vectorial case. Okay, this result relies on a new potential theoretic approach to non-uniformly elliptic operator. And in a way, we are able to linearize, to push forward this linearization ideology and to treat uniformly elliptic and non-uniformly elliptic operators as uniformly elliptic ones. In turn, this can be treated as linear operators. Therefore, you can transport to the non-linear, non-uniformly elliptic case. And then um, you can um, cover the previous results. And you can uh, have, a, a, in the classical uniformly elliptic case, you can extend some recent results of Chanky and Mazia that requires boundary conditions. Well, when f is equal to zero, you can recover all the standard theory, even the one in knowledge spaces. So essentially, this is a general result that recovers the previous ones when f is equal to zero, and then, uh, uh, and then uh, um, uh, it finds this new condition to be essential. For instance, for instance, uh, uh, let me show you why the shape of this estimate is not strange. So look at, uh, at the left-hand side. So it might appear odd, but it is actually not. Because for instance, when G1 is S to the P minus two, as in the P Laplacian case, this is S to the P minus one, and this is DU to the P, which is exactly what you get in the P Laplacian case. And in fact, 
when f is uh, due to the p, then the previous estimate defined for the p Laplacian operator. Instead, when f is equal to zero and you get pq growth conditions, you go back to the basic result of Merchant Lean. But you can go further. You can, for instance, treat any combination of exponential functionals getting still the same condition. So these old and these uh, these functionals, uh, they, they look at uh, they look out because uh, in one way it should be easier to prove that minimizes our Lipschitz continuity because you're penalizing more and more higher higher power of powers of gradient. It is actually not because they do not satisfy the delta two conditions and in practice they are they turn out to be unmanageable uh, if you use the usual techniques. But with the new trick, then this can be treated essentially you know in, a, in an easier way. Um, um, in particular, when f is equal to zero, we are able to get by Marcellini many years ago. So the estimate we find is this one, and it exhibits optimal growth, because here you find due to the p, and on the left-hand side you find a log, a log cancels the exp, the, uh, the mean, and then you get due to the p and due to the p. So the previous estimate obtained by Marcellini looked uh, as, uh, as this one and it exhibited the whole loss of an exponential uh, factor. Needless to say, this holds for any general functional of this type in the knowledge setting. So whenever you have a, a functional of this type and A of T does not satisfy the delta two condition, then you are still able to prove the same estimate. So you can allow, for instance, 10, 20, or 200 times of compositions of exponentials, no matter. This result has been uh, open in this, in this kind of theory for many years, uh, because it was, um, I mean, there are people by uh, Talenti, Chanky Fusco, and other people, they always assume the delta two condition. Now we are finally able to, to drop this delta two condition. The delta two condition is classical in harmonic analysis and also in other papers by nonlinear PDs and uh, tells that you can control a, uh, you can double the, what you have under the, the parentheses with, with no loss. This is obviously not the case of the exponential. Uh, okay, so this tells that uh, when you look for a right hand side perturbation, when you look for a right hand side perturbation, then um, uh, then the right there is no difference there is no difference between the nonlinear uniformly elliptic case and the non uniformly elliptic one. Now we want to see the presence of the other coefficient and then we put of the other perturbation and we, we put an x we put an x. Uh, okay, now let me let me uh, show you these two functionals originally introduced by Zhikov in the 80s. The first one became incredibly popular. So you immediately see that in this case, uh, the presence of of, the, of, a, uh, of a coefficient cannot be treated via perturbation methods. Why? Because uh, the whole idea of Korn's the trick uh, of shadow estimates is the, is the idea, is the following. You have a variable coefficient, you freeze the coefficient in one point, and then uh, since the coefficient is continuous or is elder or is whatever it is, then if you move a bit the variable x, then you don't see any real difference in, in the growth and the ellipticity properties of the, of the operator. So this is essentially not the case here because look in the first case, when P moves, you change from one P to another. So a small variation of the X corresponds to a total different variations of the eigenvalues with respect to the gradient. And the situation becomes even more drastic with the second functional, the double phase functional, because when A of X, in the, at those points where A of X is larger, strictly larger than zero, then, you have a functional with Q growth with respect to the gradient. So with an ellipticity dictated by the gradient to the Q minus P. 
while when a of x goes is zero, then you have a p functional. So it's the very presence of the coefficient making the functional, let's say, non-uniformly elliptic with unbalanced growth. And therefore, this is a first warning sign. It's a red flag towards the fact that uh, under, I mean, the combination of the presence of coefficients and non-uniform ellipticity cannot be treated uh, via standard perturbation methods. On the contrary of what we have seen before. In fact, there is this theorem uh, that is exampled by Fonseca, Mali, and myself many years ago. Actually, it built on uh, certain very nice constructions by Vasily Zhikov, who was a genius of Russian mathematics. Um, Zhikov was really a, a guy with pure and deep ideas. Um, okay, uh, we take P less than N, less than N plus alpha, less than Q. And then we consider this innocent convex regular scalar functional with the coefficient which is as regular as you like. But still, the idea is that the more regular is the coefficient and the more you prescribe than P and Q are far from each other. And then you find a minimizer, which is just as bad as any other competitor, because any competitor is in W1P, because, and a minimizer, of course, is in W1P, because it makes the energy finite. But um, you know that uh, a W1P function has a set of essential discontinuities whose house of dimension doesn't exceed n minus p. So this tells that uh, essentially a minimizer can be as bad as any other competitor. Uh, never, also, you get a convex scalar functional with I mean, regular coefficients, in particular, Hilder coefficients. And um, this, is, this tells you that Korn's theory is not okay. Why is not okay? Because if A of X would be, would be constant, then minimizers would be Lipschitz. So if you freeze, you get, if you make A of X vary, yet, in a Hilder continuous way, then you get uh, um, a irregular minimizer. So there's a drastic transition from uniform, from uniform and non-uniform ellipticity. Uh, on the other hand, many years later, in a series of papers, we were able to discover the, the I mean, a general theory. And uh, for instance, if you if we consider this minimizer of this functional then starting from the counterexample, the counterexample prescribes then P in Q differ, differs from uh, uh, by alpha. Then if you contradict this condition, which is this one, if you contradict this condition, then you can prove uh, all the regularity you like. Essentially, you, you take the functional back to the standard P Laplacian operator. So in particular, if Q over P is less than one plus alpha over N, and so you see the matching, the dual matching between N and alpha, then you can prove that U is elder continuous, which is the maximal regularity you might expect, because when A of X is equal to zero, this is the P Laplacian functional, and this is the classical theorem of Uyalseva. Then if you assume that u is in L infinity, then exactly as in the, in the autonomous case, you can prove regularity when p and q differ from alpha. And this is exactly what you get from the counterexample. So this tells you that, the, that uh, th this bound is sharp. And moreover, you get that also the next interpolative effect. So the high, the more you get, you assume on the solution if u is, is, and in the limit, gamma, when gamma is equal to one, there's nothing to prove because the focal theory, uh, I mean, the, the, the focus point, uh, the focus is on Lipschitz regularity. So when u is C0, one, then there's nothing to prove. And in fact, there's no bound you might assume. So therefore, this is a, this is a, um, this is a display for this, uh, this model functional, which is in the realm of PQ growth functionals, probably the worst functional, which is non-autonomous. 
And actually, um, this is a, a result that comes after a first series of papers by Maria Colombo and myself. Um, then uh, in these papers with Paolo Baroni, we extend uh, the theory to more general functionals of this type with, um, uh, with a double phase structure. And then there's a nice paper by Balci, Dinning, and Sunashov that um, they extend uh, this, uh, this kinds of fractal constructions. And then they prove uh, that, uh, that also this, uh, this bound that we found is optimal. So we found the bound, we found this bound, this bound implying regularity, this condition implying regularity by making computations. And, um, and in this theorem, this was the only bound that we were not, uh, we were not assured to be, to be optimal because the, the optimality of the first two bounds is guaranteed by the previous counter examples. So this paper by Balchidi and Gersunachov tells that this bound is optimal uh, too. And we are happy with that. Okay, now let me briefly explain you um, some, sort, uh, some sort of deeper effect. Where is this bound coming from? Okay, um, uh, in the non-autonomous case, uh, the way you're measuring non-uniform ellipticity is a bit more extended than the previous one. You do not want to pointwise measure the ratio between the highest and the lowest eigenvalue. What you do, you fix a ball because your integral estimates are always on balls and then these balls are eventually shrinking. And then you measure the ratio between the soup of the highest eigenvalue and the inf with respect to the lowest eigenvalue. And this is exactly this quantity. And now you see here, you see, uh, and this, of course, you're doing the transition set where a of x touches zero, in a ball where it touches zero. Okay, and now you see that there's a competition between the distance between q and p makes this object, so the gradient, to grow faster. So it is an obstruction to regularity, while the presence of r to the alpha tends to correct this, uh, this largeness because it tends to I mean, to make things smaller. And here is the competition and the interplay between Q and P and alpha. But this is actually a capacitor effect. Uh, take BR, this is the ball, centered at zero, and then compute the standard P capacity. The standard P capacity is the following one, and it's uh, more or less R to the N minus P. On the other end, if you do consider the special k a of x equal to x to the alpha, so there's another capacity that you might like to associate with your problem. This is a weighted capacity of the type um, studied at length by users, by Maziafris and others. Okay, and therefore you get another capacity. So the idea is that the problem generates two capacities. But the two capacities are not good if they read different sets. If, you, if they read different sets, then you open the way to construct irregular solutions. Because uh, the energy can concentrate all the, all the effort on uh, and being, uh, let's say, good, uh, I mean, good on uh, sets with, uh, with uh, pos uh, positive capacities, and that can be very, very bad on sets with zero capacity. So if these two capacities don't read the same sets, then there could be a problem. So let's impose the condition that this, the second capacity, which is a priori worse, because it grows with a higher exponent, is controlled by the first one. And uh, this is exactly the bound showing you that minimizes are regular. So it's a capacitor effect. You have a, a functional that nature that there's no singularity if the two sets, uh, if the two capacities read the same sets, and then you find the conditions for which the zero sets of the of the of the lowest capacities are also the zero sets of the other capacities, actually the, on the contrary. And then you, you, you come up with, uh, with a bound ensuring you for regularity, because we know that capacity is very much connected to regularity via the concept of removability of singularities. 
So it's a capacitor effect. And um, then there can be several extensions. For instance, there is this uh, nice extensions by Cristiana de Filippis and OH that tells that now you can generalize this multi to multi-phase functional. You can uh, connect several different powers with several different coefficients. All of them are Hilder continuous and then the same phenomenon distributes on different scales. So the, so the idea of the, of, the previous, of the previous result is that uh, the more the regular is coefficient and the more you allow for the two exponents to be far and then you can actually distribute this on every scale simultaneously. This is called multi-phase variational problem. So this gives you another, another piece of the complexity of the things that can happen when no uniformity is considered. And then uh, you can also extend this, uh, this theory to, to fully nonlinear elliptic setting. This is a, a, a result by Cristiana de Filippis. And then you can extend these results, for instance, by Imbert and Silvestre and by Teixeira and um, uh, some, some uh, co-authors and some students of him where they consider due to the PX. Then Cristiana de Filippi is considered this type of degeneration and is still able to prove in the setting of viscosity solutions that uh, solutions are regular. So this is another recent paper by de Filippi. Okay. Um, in particular, you can extend the theory connecting to several other aspects connected to capacity. Let me give you two examples. The first one is that uh, we consider the problem uh, of minimizing uh, this energy, but pay attention, now we consider the problem uh, of minimizing this energy when uh, the values are uh, taken into the sphere. So now the solution takes maps in, uh, I mean, we analyzed the, uh, the, the, the minimization problem where you make a sphere constraint. So now all competitors and minimizers should be considered on the sphere, on the sphere. So we have the following theorem with Christian de Filippis that tells that partial regularity in the, in the style of Schenunebeck also holds in the case, in the case of these minimizers. But you have to be careful and you have to prescribe the smallness condition of the Schoen and Uhlenbeck in an intrinsic way using a properly relaxed coefficient. So essentially you can replicate this theory under the usual bound, under the usual bound, Q minus P less than alpha, and then you can prove partial regularity in the sense that, uh, that these maps, it's a constrained minimizer, so with values into the sphere, then you can prove partial regularity. So regularity outside a closed singular set with, that has zero measure. In particular, when um, A of X is zero, this is the standard theory by Lukaus, Fuchs, um, higher than lean, and when p is equal to two, and a of x is equal to zero, this is Schengen and Ulen. And this you can also avoid, uh, you don't care if the subset is not dense or not. Well, if you want to estimate, as it is usual in these cases, the, the, the house of dimension of the singular set, then this is usually done via house of measures. Now we, we want to extend this uh, from a conceptual viewpoint, and uh, we want to define this new intrinsic house of measures that takes into account the variability with respect to the gradient with the variability with respect to the coefficient. So what you, what you usually do with house of measure, you consider powers of the radius, or you consider either powers or functions of the radius. Here we consider this quantity, which is a sort of, uh, non-autonomous gauge functions. It's a gauge function in the sense that it depends on X. And then we make the usual uh, standard Carathéodory construction, not using powers, but using these objects that are non-homogeneous due to the presence of X. And this can be done for any function, for any general function. 
So in the, in the classical case, in particular, what is this? When phi is t to the p, this is nothing but r to the n minus p. So it's the Hausdorff dimensions connected to the p capacity. So when phi is equal to, when phi is independent of x and phi of t is equal to t to the p, uh, this is nothing but t to the, r to the n minus p. So you are making the n minus p Hausdorff dimension, which is connected to the usual p capacity. Otherwise, it is what it is. You make the usual Cartier-Audrey reconstructions with the covering, and then you let the maximal radius of the covering go to zero. And then you get this new estimate. So this is an extension of, uh, of the Hausdorff dimension, because when phi is equal to t to the p, as I said before, this is the usual n minus p Hausdorff dimension. When uh, this is uh, t to the px, it's another, it falls in the realm of variable exponent spaces. When w, uh, when phi can be written in this way, this is a weighted Hausdorff measure. It's called a Mackinac measure. It's uh, studied very often in uh, harmonic analysis. Otherwise, this is a, a, a general extension that extends all these concepts altogether. If you want to have more references to these kinds of measures, especially the first one, this one, this weighted out of measure, um, uh, look at the paper by Nieminen and the book by Tuleson, where they analyze this kind of measure. So what we introduce is a general extension of this locally non-isotropic house of measures. So this is what we do because they are, more, they are the most suited to the problem. And in particular, we are able to prove what you do expect is that the, the Hausdorff dimension is uh, this one. You know that the Hausdorff dimension can be made precise, can be made precise by, by the use of gauche functions. And actually you use that with respect to this new measure, the measure of the singular set is zero. So once again, this is an extension of the classical theory. So this is, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a paper we wrote to demonstrate how all the classical settings can be extended from a geometric and from a real analysis and harmonic analysis viewpoint. But you can actually go further on and you can consider the classical problem of removability of singularities. This is a classical problem considered by Verons. Uh, the Verons and uh, for the P Laplacian case, and it goes back to Carlesson in the classical harmonic case, and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, to to Selwyn, uh, and then there are all these uh, fantastic papers by Verons and uh, so forth. But now we consider the same, the same extent, the same problem, but using this non-uniform elliptic operator. So what you would expect is that the previous house of measures and the previous capacities, they come into the play. So that's the idea. So the, the house of measures that uh, the Philippis and myself introduced, they should come into the play and they should rebuild the classical picture when the, the conditions for regularity occurs. Because we have seen that these conditions for regularity, they regulate the balance of the two capacities and therefore the new removability problems. And uh, in fact, there is this nice paper by Ivon Kaklebicka and Christiana De Filippis that tells the following. Assume that you have a solution of the previous equation outside a, 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 a closed subset. This is the usual removability statement. So you get a, a solution of your equation outside a closed set. Then you assume that this uh, solution has the, the following a priori irregularity, which is a often the case in the standard case. And then you can prove that the set is removable. Therefore, you can extend this to be a solution over the full omega, if and only if there is this, there is this measure, this condition on the measure. And this is the condition that gives you back the classical result and connects you with the elder continuity. In particular, you see that when you, when you, have, when you approach to nothing, beta zero equal to zero, you get the usual, just the usual measure. And this is what? This is the n minus p Hausdorff measure. So this 
covers the classical cases, and it's, a, it's an extension of the other results by Kirpelainen, who proved that there is a balance between the a priori regularity of solutions and the, the size of removable sets. So this, in fact, when a of x is equal to zero, this gives you back the classical results by Kirpelainen. There's a book, yeah, where he has this, these kinds of results. Okay, last part of the talk. What happens with general functionals? So when you go behind, when you go behind, uh, for, okay, for general functionals, there is this, um, there are these recent results of, by Marcellini and Coulters. There's especially a new results by Di Marco and Marcellini. And, uh, but let me consider the case of general functionals. So I know, now go back to PQ functionals. And I take a PQ growth functional. The ellipticity, that is the monotonicity, is prescribed with rate P. The growth is given on the first derivatives by convexity. And I assume, once again, that the dependence on x is elder continuous. So I do not assume that this is the double phase functional. I do consider any functional. And then, um, in, under these conditions, there's something which is called Lavrentiev phenomenon. Now we assume that there is no Lavrentiev phenomenon, otherwise minimizers are irregular by other means. And then we prove that the same bound that holds for, that works for, that works for uh, double phase functional, uh, for the double phase functional actually works for any kind of functional. So the proofs uses several things like interpolation inequality in fractional subolar spaces and certain approximation and penalization methods. And finally, let me, let me, give, you, let me give you a bonus by showing how you can, um, you can adapt this idea that started with this papers uh, with this paper uh, with Lisa Beck, we can we can go much further. And this is a, an interesting. So the idea is how to linearize things. So how to 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 treat non-uniform ellipticity as it were uniform ellipticity. Um, so let me show you how to prove the a priori estimate. Just the a priori estimate. Then via approximation you can prove the real regularity result. So I take the standard theory. So I take the standard Marcellini setting, PQ growth functionals. So P growth on the F and its derivatives and growth from above like Q. And these are the sharp conditions allowing for Lipschitz continuity. So this is a standard result in the literature. Now let me show you how uh, um, in a, uh, this result can be streamlined via the previous approach. So what I claim, this my claim here is that, that uh, I can treat the PQ case as it were P equals to Q. So the idea is that if I know how to deal with the case P equals to Q, then in two lines, I can take the case P different than Q. And I can prove this estimate, which is the estimate which is known in the literature. So the idea is not now having uh, a new proof, a proof of this fact, because this fact is, is known, uh, is to get a proof of this fact using just the p-theory, the standard p-theory. Okay, the first thing you do, so this is a, a streamlined way of how to reduce uniform, non-uniform ellipticity to, to uniform ellipticity. So the first thing you do, you exploit a very, very hidden fact. You go to the case of p, of the p Laplacian, you carefully check the constants in the proof, and you find that this is the constant dependence. L is this constant, and you can always assume that mu is equal to one by eventually dividing everything by mu. So usually the constant dependence is uh, omitted in the regularity proofs, but now we just uh, bet everything on this specific constant dependence. So we just go into the standard proof, and we see that the constant dependence is exactly this one. Okay, 
Now we go to the PQ case and we see that we can rewrite on a ball, B tau two, we can rewrite the growth conditions from above, the Q growth conditions, we can rewrite them as P growth conditions. We just remember that whenever we are using this equation, Z is du. So we can plug out the gradient, the L infinity modulus of the gradient, and we make this to be P again. So we make Q be P again by a constant, a different constant. So what's the gain? The gain is that you go back to the PKs. You are now in the traditional setting, but the price you pay is that the constant depends on the solution itself. Now you are back to the PKs and you just use the previous estimate, this one, but you use it with a different constant L, capital L, which is this one. So you get this estimate. And now look at this exponent. What's the bad point here? You would like to have L infinity only on the left hand side while you get both on the left and on the right hand side. So you would like to get rid of the right hand side dependence on L infinity only. Now you look at this exponent and this exponent is Q minus P times N over P. And then you wonder when this exponent is less than one and you discover that this exponent is less than one exactly under the condition which is known to provide the thing. So you can just apply Young's inequality and you get this inequality. So you see, you are taking the P dependence, you make it explicit via the constant capital L and the two radii, and then you apply it with the new choice of the constant. And then you make Young's inequality. Now observe that if tau one would be equal to tau two, there would be no problem in making the absorption, but the subpart is increasing, but there's no problem because there is a classical lemma you originally first observed by Jaguint and Just is as simple as powerful. In fact, they call the simple but fundamental lemma that tells you that if you are in this situation, you can just reabsorb the right hand dependence as it were on the same support. So you apply this with the, with the choice capital Z equals to this function, and you can just reabsorb the right hand side in the left hand side. And then you get the estimate. In particular, when, this, when P is equal to Q, from this estimate, you get the usual estimate. So everything fits. So this is just a little uh, cheat trick to show uh, certain ideas then, that are then developed in a, a larger, larger um, setting, allowing you to uh, treat non-uniformly elliptic problems as uniformly elliptic ones, and then eventually as linear ones. And the final result is that as long as the right hand side is concerned, there's no difference, while as long as the coefficients are there, there are these sharp bounds related to the capacitor phenomenon. And I think this was the last slide, and I thank you for your attention.